This is Laura DeFranco, holistic physical therapist and owner of Brave Healer Productions. I'm excited to bring you my new holistic healing series where you're going to learn from the experts what it means to live fiercely alive, mind, body, and soul. I invite you now to take a breath, relax, and feel the vibe of the words my guest has to share with you today. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. We have a very special episode for you. Some collaborative badassery from four of the expert authors of The Ultimate Guide to Self-Healing, volume four. You guys, I woke up one day in March of 2020 from a dream about helping the world heal at home with real, powerful, practical tools you can practice from the pages of our books. When volume one was born, I did not realize we'd be sitting here today almost a year later talking to you about volume four. Like, whoa, the journey has been incredible and I'm honored to be sharing the stories and messages of these world changing healers and business owners today. Please let me introduce you to some of the authors of The Ultimate Guide. Hi, ladies. Thank you for being Hello. here. Hi. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you guys. Okay, you guys, so we have um, Esther Apusidis. I'm, I know I'm butchering your last name again. Let's hope that I don't do that too many more times. She wrote Chapter 13, The Energy Alignment Method, Finding Your True Calling in Life. She's an Energy Alignment Method mentor and business coach. She helps women get out of their own way using energy alignment work and instructs them with in-flow marketing and sales strategies, how to create and build a passion-led business that inspires, uplifts, and fulfills them. I have Kelly Meyerson here. She's the author of chapter 11, Sacred Sleep, Cultivate the Best Sleep of Your Life. Anyone? Anyone need that? Yeah. Kelly is an author, speaker, and coach who helps overwhelmed working moms light up the world going from burned out to radiating joy. A sensory trained occupational therapist and sleep expert, she'll guide you to great sleep and overall wellness. Are you ready for the best night of sleep ever? Yes, Kelly. I have Miss Dynasta, Dynasta, Miss Cayenne Thomas, and she wrote chapter 25, Writing to Live Again, Discover the Power of the Pen. She is an author, performer, and safe space facilitator. As a social worker, she melds her profession and passion to help others be empowered through poetry, reflective writing, and creative expression. Consequent, <laughs> easy for me to say. Consequently, Dynasta established the Inkwell, a nonprofit to facilitate a hopeful sense of awareness through reflective, creative writing. And later on, you guys, I'm going to talk about some of the proceeds from our book sales that are going to be going to the Inkwell. And lastly, we have Susan Gertner here. She wrote Chapter 19, Rebranding Alcoholism, a tool for heightened awareness and early detection. She's a communication strategist and owner of When a Woman Starts Over, a communications consulting firm specializing in women's rights, reproductive rights, and gender equity. You guys, I have all of these brilliant women hooked up for you in the show notes down below, their websites, all of the good stuff. Um, Esther, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little bit about your story, kind of how you got to doing what you're doing today and a little bit about the chapter that you wrote. Okay, yeah. So all my professional life, I've been experimenting, I think, and it's led me up to this point. Uh, my career has sort of dipped and, um, and rose and I've felt that sometimes I was in flow and sometimes, and a lot of the time I was out of flow. And this culminated in um, a decision that I did felt in flow mostly when I was not working for somebody else, but working for myself. I started a coffee shop business, but what I forgot was actually the self-care, self-preservation piece. And I went totally after five years of nonstop working into burnout. Um, it was also um, 
I think exacerbated by the fact that we had uh, a lot of illness um, attached to my mother, to my mother-in-law, and I decided that I was not going to pursue it and sell it. Um, and that's when I started my um, discovery of therapies. I retrained from marketing in, and I trained in holistic therapies. And I uh, stumbled on the energy alignment method as part of that and truly understood the power of our energy, specifically our heart energy. And over the years, how often I've failed, you know, I've often ignored the messages from my heart. And that's what I wanted to share in this chapter, that you too can, it, when you're totally aware and in tune with your higher self, you can listen to the message, the powerful message of your heart to find your true purpose. And that's where what I'm living now. I'm finally find, finding my feet. Uh, in this on this planet and and serving a higher purpose my true dharma so the higher self and the heart that's the connection right how do you get people to connect into that heart space what's the first thing you might do so, uh, typically I, I help them with their breathing um, so that takes them out of their head for so decades i've been working in the corporate field always thinking, strategizing, using the head energy. And that's where we fail to listen to the heart energy. And um, breathing is a key uh, way of getting unstuck, getting out of our head into our heart and into our body. And also um, I, the tool that I use, the energy alignment method also helps with that because we are clearly aware of all the layers of our energy, um, both our um, mental and our emotional and our physical and also the three electromagnetic centers, as we call them, the head, heart, and there's a third one, the hara. The head, heart, and what was the third one? Hara. So hara. It's, yeah. it's connected to uh, the base and the sacral chakra. So it's once um, everything's in alignment, then we can actually take aligned action. It's only when actually everything is in sync that we can actually truly take intuitive action. Man, I will never forget you guys. I had the first blog of my world go viral. This was a few years ago. And the one negative comment on that viral blog um, was commenting about how could you teach people to listen to your heart instead of the head? And I was just like, oh, and I was so triggered by the negativity of that comment, right? Um, and of course, the bigger we go out with our messages, the bigger and louder. It's not like if those critics will show up, it's when you have to learn how to deal, right? And so I love listening to Esther talk about the heart connection really being the connection to that higher power and higher source. And I'm gonna um, take you Esther with me so we can go talk to that guy, okay? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I say it's the conduit to the soul because I really feel it is because yes. we are emotional. We are human beings. As I say in my piece, it, we're not human doings. We are come from a being place. And when we really connect with that, the, the emotional part, it's, it's, that's, that's the connection to source energy. I love it. Thank you, Esther. Um, all right, Kelly, I'm moving to you and we're going to talk about getting the best night of sleep ever. Tell us about your journey. Yeah, so I, I totally resonate with the idea of being a little more connected with yourself. Um, I had spent years and years working as an occupational therapist with families with kids with special needs and their challenges with sleep. And then when I became a mom, it's like I lost all of that and lost myself a little bit in it. And couldn't figure out how to get myself back together again. You know, I'm sure all new moms can resonate with not getting enough sleep and the effects that that has on you. Um, and it really all came down to learning to prioritize my own self-care and my wellness um, before giving to everyone, whether it's my, my family, whether it's to work, um, whether it's to friends, but really trying to honor myself in all of that. Yeah. So, you know, how do you take somebody who's in the middle of overwhelm and start them on the journey? You do this so well with some basic, basic things, you know, to start with. What what do you think is the thing that people aren't doing, like the most important thing to set that environment up? What aren't they doing? I think the first thing they're not doing is recognizing the impact that a disorganized environment has on your well-being and your sleep. 
So, you know, just kind of pushing everything aside in the bedroom, letting those baskets of laundry remain there for days on end. They don't realize that that is reflective of their mind and impacts their mind. So clearing some of that clutter and creating an environment that is more calm and aligned with the piece that you want at bedtime can be really helpful. I love that. I will never forget when I feng shui the bedroom for the first time and really cleared the spaces. And I remember somebody telling me to get the underneath of the bed. And I thought, uh, you know, and I got down on the floor to look underneath the bed. And I thought, all right, I got a little bit of work to do there with my bins and things and the dust and oh my goodness. Um, but the feeling of, um, freedom, the feeling of being able to breathe in that room, that was real. What else about that did you want to talk about? I think if you're someone for whom this seems so overwhelming, this is what I want you to do. I want you to set a timer for 10 minutes and I want you to take your nightstand and put on some music, put on, put a diffuser on with some essential oils you like, or a candle I want you to literally get into this feeling of pleasure and joy and excitement about 10 dedicated minutes to cleaning and decluttering one small space and just have at it. When that timer goes off after 10 minutes, you're going to feel this feeling of like, well, I got this. I can just keep going. I don't want you to do that. I want you to stop because what you're doing is you're retraining your reticular activating system in your brain to see cleaning and decluttering as enjoyable. So you want to stop and reward yourself with a nice cup of tea or coffee and just celebrate what you did. And then the important second half of that is you have to maintain what you've decluttered. So even if your bedroom is a total disaster, your nightstand is where you start and you just cultivate that and keep that nice and clear every day. I love it. Baby steps. And that's going to retrain your brain. I made such huge leaps from really intense laundry and cleaning resentment to actually loving that time. And it is a big, big deal. Energy changer, game changer. Right. So, yeah, super awesome. Um, thank you, Kelly. Um, all right. Dynasta, Miss Cayenne Thomas, talk to me about your journey and this amazing chapter you wrote. Certainly, certainly. I am, first of all, gleaning so much already from talk, hearing the authors speak of their areas of expertise. And Kelly, I'm going to try that. My nightstand needs attention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Dynasta Cayenne uh, Thomas, and so I go by Miss Cayenne affectionately. My story uh, is so long, but I think one of the things that brought me to this place is very early on in my life, uh, experiencing loss. I, I lost my mother at a very young age. My father uh, was alive but not present. And I had a sibling who was uh, removed from our home. And so from a child, the kind of feeling like um, the very pillars of my life were removed very early on. And so having to navigate that um, very easily could lead me to places of getting into trouble, suspension from school, uh, becoming statistics. A statistic, a statistic in some sort. Um, and I was headed in that direction for a short period of time. Uh, but I found my journal. I found something called writing. Um, and at the time, as a young person in elementary school, my school at the time actually fostered writing, creative writing in every subject. We were writing poems in science class. So it was a fostered activity, but I, I dug into it very early as an outlet, right, to, to uh, manage the grief that I was uh, bearing because I didn't have another outlet or, I, again, I could have found myself in bad situations. So the pen became an outlet for me. And, and so what I later discovered in life is that, man, this thing helped to heal me, helped to save me, helped to protect me in a lot of ways, gave me voice. If it did it for me, perhaps it can do it for others as well. Who else is who else is grieving? Who else is uh, suffering quietly and does not have a, an appropriate outlet? And I began to share the, the, the power of writing with others. You know, um, I know you know personally how much I love this subject and 
and writing as a healing tool. And I've written about the same thing and love to help people with that process. For me, it was like I would write stuff in my journals and and or poems or whatever was moving through. And sometimes I would look down at those pages and I would be like, whoa, do I think that? Like, so the awareness of the moment of the writing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely that awareness that I call them the aha moments or, you know, we've used that term in other uh, industries as well. And, and it, it, it's amazing what will come through in a 10 minute exercise or a five minute exercise. You look back at what you put on that paper and uh, the internal parts become the, begin to come out. And then you can now deal with that in a more palatable way. Yeah, so awesome. Do you remember when you shifted from the private pages of your journal to writing and speaking it out loud? Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, you know, I don't remember the the, the age and all that, but I do remember the season of my life. I think um, I, I started as a young adult, maybe, maybe teenager, uh, sharing something with a friend, just secretly, you know, pushing the paper over. Hey, read this. What do you think? scared out of my mind because that's a vulnerable place to share that with anyone and just wondering. And, and I remember someone saying to me, wow, I, you've captured what I've been feeling. And I had never heard that statement before. I only thought that's what I was feeling, that I was in silo in that way. And so when a person, uh, when that person shared with me, you, you've captured on paper exactly how I feel or how I have felt, I began to transition to understand, oh, maybe this isn't just about me and my private pages, but perhaps uh, there's a bigger calling, there's a bigger responsibility to share because as I'm healed in my writing, um, perhaps others, now this is the first tier, this is the actually the second tier, perhaps others can be healed from hearing what I've shared. And I've since moved from perhaps others can learn to heal themselves by writing themselves. So it, it was kind of like a tier step of movement. Yes, you go first, you be the trailblazer, people pick that up. And all of a sudden, they feel they have permission to do it as well. Yeah. And it's so powerful. Um, and I love your poetry, um, powerful, pow powerful, brave words um, that you share. And um, we have shared moments uh, in person, yeah. not for a while, but on those stages, I know, <laughs> on those stages. And I just, I so appreciate you also from a standpoint of um, helping me stay brave. We need our community around us to help us stay brave, mm -hmm. right? One day it feels one way, but we wake up the next day and maybe we don't feel that so much for some reason, but then we have our friend next to us doing it and we can do it again, right? And I just, I love that. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right, so Susan Gertner, talk to me about your story and about this beautiful chapter that you wrote. Thank you, Laura. I, I first have to say though, I've, I've read the whole book and I've read all the chapters, but this is super cool to hear people talk about their chapters. I mean, this is really <laughs> stunning. So thank you, this is amazing. Uh, my chapter on alcoholism has a lot of emotions with me. And the first emotion is pretty much anger about society's uh, lost opportunities and how it handles alcoholism and how it treats it as something to be shamed, something to be criticized, laughed at, when it's a progressive disease. So it's a, a serious progressive disease. Nobody's immune from it. Uh, we all have this potential to have this disease. And just the word progressive tells you the earlier you catch it, the better off you're going to be. And so my chapter is about how I caught this disease at an early stage. And it wasn't easy because of all the stigma and all the shame, everything involved with it. Um, you are a bad mother, you are a bad employee, you're a bad neighbor. Those are things that people run from. And that has to be changed because I, it, it's, it's an amazing thing when you can catch this disease at an early stage. And I was able to stop it dead in its tracks. And that's my story. That's my tool. And so, yeah. 
You know, with your ability to lay that down in words, um, the awareness, and let me just say to all of you, thank you so much, not only for saying yes to this book, but for taking the challenge to, you know, your master teachers, you do that every day, you can speak it, it's easy for you, but then to actually get it in words in a way that the reader can read those words and actually have the practical experience. That's challenging and that takes skill. And you all did that so beautifully in your chapters. And Susan, your, that's yours is making me think of that because the way somebody lays down their process and gives us the gift of the window into their own mind, that awareness that you gifted us right, is going to be the change for somebody in only the way that you could have said it. So tell me more about how you were able to do that. <laughs> do you even know? Well, awareness is, it was actually key to it. Um, that's just staying aware of it was, was one of the main things. But to get to the point of even doing the awareness, you do have to overcome um, the societal stigma and the shame. And you have to recognize that societal, societal stigma and shame for what it is. And uh, you, you you, one of the big things is you have to recognize the disease as a progressive disease. So in my mind, I associated it very closely with cancer, which I've experienced with in my family. And I talk about, talk about this in my chapter. And when I really connected the two, that was kind of a game changer for me. Um, but I, I have to say awareness was a part of this and I take people through the tool of, of how I stayed aware and how I really reviewed things in my past to try to identify the uh, kind of red flags. I talk about it as red flags and and it's it's hard. It's not something that, that it's an addiction. So it's not something that stops immediately. And it is the continued living with that awareness, which can get you to the point of saying, ah, this is, this is alcoholism. Because you're not searching to have alcoholism. When you're aware of this, you're searching to not have alcoholism. You're searching to not have a problem, to be okay. But uh, it's, there's a whole mix that goes into all of this. But I'd have to say, Laura, that awareness was absolutely, absolutely the key. Okay, so I can't help myself. We're going to stick with this theme for a minute for all of you. So, um, Susan, let's let's stay with you for just a minute on this because I'm going to slide into a little bit deeper conversation about awareness. Listen, I learned early on that if you have awareness, you get choices. It's the topic I write about in all of my own chapters in the Ultimate Guide books, and essentially all of you, all the authors and all of the books are offering some kind of awareness tool. That's the beauty of this. Um, when you have awareness, you have the moments of healing, right? It's all, it's very foundational and all connected. So talk to me now just about the importance of awareness in terms of your personal practice, life, you know, you may not, you may connect to this to lots of topics, not just your chapter topic. Yeah, I, I do think when you start to become aware that you have choices, um, one of the things for me is sometimes I can tend to act on emotion and then I have to make myself aware of that I have, that this is an emotion. Then I have to make myself aware of the story behind the emotion. And boy, it opens up a whole new world of choices. You're just not automatically thrown into the world and automatically roll, roll, roll with the world. It's extremely empowering when you realize that you have choices. But there's, there's that process that you have to go through to get to the fact that, ah, this is a choice. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of awareness. As am I. Um, and the more you practice the... I don't know if it'll ever be easy, but the easier it gets and, and what happens is you're in it, in that present moment with those choices a little faster, right? Yep, so that's true. Yeah. Um, so Miss Cayenne, I'm going to move to you with this aware, same awareness question. Talk to me a little bit about the importance of it in your life, a bit about your personal practice of it. Sure. Um, it's, it's interesting. I've always 
felt like I've been a very introspective person, even as a kid, kind of like deep, just deep kid. Um, and I've, I've since become a social worker, which of course the concept of awareness and uh, is, is woven into uh, that particular uh, discipline and helping others in some fashion come to this place of awareness. And for me, what I find is I'm, I'm, I'm constantly checking myself. I'm constantly asking myself the hard questions, the questions that perhaps we may think to ask others about things we see, but we don't. And definitely questions that we probably should ask ourselves, but maybe are afraid of the answers. But I'm, I'm, I believe in interweaving that concept of, of asking myself the difficult questions and then sitting quietly and honestly answering those questions. And then what happens for me is um, uh, there's, I like really the connection I have is this word called enlightenment. And I was thinking about this uh, and, and thinking about you and the book and even this, this day and just the word enlightenment, the light from the inside out versus letting the world impact you. Things are, the light is shining on you or you're being impacted by something. Enlightenment is that light is internally emanating out. So that light is now, you are the first partaker. I am the first partaker of this, of, of this awareness of the light inside the, the, the dark things inside of me, I now can see. And then also I can provide light for externally, like it's inside out and that others can now be aware as well because, or see, or as a trailblazer or just being purposeful in the world around you and being who you are, you can emanate light as well. And so, for me, that awareness is one, asking myself the difficult, challenging, but what's really happening? Why are you really buying five bottles of Dr. Of Dr. Pepper? Because it tastes good or you just got something <laughs> else going on? And, you know, why not allow that light to start here and then emanate out that enlightenment? That's how that works for me. Or, Susan? Can, you, it's so resonated when you just said about the ask yourself the question. Yes. That was key in my tool also. That was key. You, I, you have to ask yourself the question, could this be alcoholism? And then you lean into it. You don't run from the question. Right. The hard part is society has made for alcoholism. You run from the question, you turn and you run as quickly as possible. But when you said you ask the question and then really lean into it to look yeah. for an answer, I, I really resonated with that. Certainly, certainly. I have always been addicted to the big, juicy questions of life. I was laying in bed last night, you guys, seriously talking to my now 18-year-old daughter, and I took a risk. We were laying there looking at her Instagram pictures, okay? So that's where she's at in her life, looking at her Instagram, whatever. And we just had a great time to, to talk. And I said, you know, she, was, she asked me, what are you thinking, mom? And I said... I'm always thinking about the big, crazy things about life, like the meaning of life and all of the, you know, this and that. And I said, I think I've done that forever. And, and to have a conversation with my daughter that was like that was just a moment for me, right? And anytime you can say it out loud in front of others, what you're saying, Miss Cayenne, is you're, you're, people don't know unless you're sharing it out loud. It's all inside of you in your head. So unless you're actually verbalizing it or writing it for people, there's none of that shining. Mm -hmm. And that's been part of my mission. So y'all are doing it today, speaking your brave words out loud. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, Kelly, talk to me about awareness and your personal practice. Absolutely. And I completely resonate with um, what everybody has said specifically about how shame makes you powerless. Um, I'm for sure a recovering good girl perfectionist, you know, do everything you can to make everybody happy. And um, I think becoming aware of that messaging that's still bouncing around in my head and figuring out how to get some distance from it and see it happening, but not be the person that is making it happen. So in awareness, I can look and see within my head, that's, that's messages that are replaying that have been, you know, on a tape from my childhood, things I picked up and took as my own. 
and I can turn that tape off and I can hijack my limbic system in my brain, my emotional center, and I can put it to work for me. And I can also tell myself that I'm a badass. I can tell myself that I'm an amazing teacher and speaker and that my words have meaning for people. And it's okay for me to go out there and I get to decide whether I feel shameful or embarrassed about the things I say and do. And I can also decide that like Miss Cayenne was saying, my words could be healing other people. And if I'm quiet, they're not helping anybody. So it's that awareness of that messaging, that ego, if you will, that's always going to be there, but that's not me. And I can put some distance between myself and my ego and be brave. Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, understanding the inner critic messages, the old unhelpful beliefs for sure. You know what I love you guys? Each of you so far has this, um, I'm making this list over here on my notebook, you know, the awareness of emotions came and then uh, Ms. Can talked about the, the awareness of those big internal questions and that enlightenment and that light and Kelly saying the awareness of those limiting beliefs and how you are living in the moment, actually speaking them, being able to catch that, right? This is, this is it, all of it. Esther, what, what do you want to add to this? Um, I always come back to the feelings. So I had a, to help me actually with my decision making, because I think my, when the client, people come to me, they are really struggling uh, with clarity, with direction, with purpose. And um, the decision making only becomes clear when we're true to our heart, when we listen in. And for example, um, some months ago, back in September, I was made redundant for my full time marketing job. And I was always hovering between should I go back in, try and get another full time job or should I just go with maybe I should be doing this coaching piece. And I wasn't too sure, but I just as soon as I started applying, something was missing. And I knew it was the heart piece that was missing. My heart wasn't in it. And I showed up for interviews, but I can tell it wasn't going to result in a positive outcome because my all wasn't in it. Uh, and that center piece is the heart piece. So when I actually started to listen in and it felt good and expansive, and it's always being aware of how, how you feel, if it's expansive rather than contracted, you know, contracting your physical body. So when it feels more like you're opening up here from the center of your core, then you know it's the right decision. It feels right. It feels intuitive. And so I've trusted myself to go with this and to go into coaching. And it's now been so rewarding. But it does come with it some fears. And it's just knowing, acknowledging that they are just their old self, the old conditioned beliefs and the old ego, just sort of wanting to be praised and be seen, but not for the right reason. You know, it's um, but this this comes from a very, very holistic place. Yes. And um, <laughs> once upon a time, I changed the word mindfulness to bodyfulness because I wanted to have people understand that it was the body awareness, the sensations, feelings, emotions, everything going on in here um, typically had a physical sensation to it or a location in the body. Right. And in terms of voice, I would always feel my throat choky, choking up and, or I would always feel like a tightness in the middle of my chest. And if I could just connect into what that was for a moment and not make it mean anything extra, right? So that, that body awareness is so, I mean, I consider that language to be the language of the heart and soul. Mm -hmm. So, so important. Um, thank you so much, Esther, for that. Um, okay, ladies, time for the speed dating question. Okay, so I want you guys to think about a, the, the short answer on this one. Um, another way that we can talk about all of the chapters in this book is with the term self care. Um, I feel like we're giving people a self care toolkit that could change the trajectory of their lives. It's that big of a deal to me. And when we truly take care of ourselves, mind, body, soul, spirit, environment, all the ways, right? We're able to serve from an overflow instead of our reserves, which will lead to burnout. We all know this. But I like to think of a full pitcher instead of the little tiny cup, right? I want to be flowing out of that big pitcher. So um, Susan, share with the listeners one of the ways you fill up that pitcher. 
Um, uh, Laura, one of the things I, I have to say, though, I, I this awareness thing hits me, but something Kelly said in particular right now is that we are so um, we focus on the negative voice in our head can be so prominent. And yet there was something you said, Kelly, that you can also think you're a badass. So that just really struck me. And so I think something that really fills my picture moving forward and I've been working on this is just really that positive voice, that positive and celebrating that positive voice. We cling to the negative voice somehow that always having that negative voice in my head, somehow it has some legitimacy. And when the positive voice comes, it's like, oh, you can't go there. I'm sorry, this is going on too long, but this is very exciting to me. I really, I really feel like I'm onto something when I can can really go with that I'm I'm a badass. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I say that a lot. I think y'all are badasses, um, and it's good to think of, think it about yourself unapologetically, right? Um, you all really should be proud of the way you have been able to take your selves, your journeys, your tools, your messages, and and be courageous enough to to put it out there. And it man, it does take something. That's why I use the word warrior a lot and badass a lot. And there it's not everybody who's able to do that. And so I thank you all for being those warriors, you know, alongside me. Um, Miss Cayenne, tell me something you do to fill your picture. Yeah, that's a good question. I do uh, what I was just thinking and I'm thinking one of the things I do is I need to create something. And while I am a poet, um, what I've learned is creativity begets creativity. And I know people who maybe they learned how to play the drums and then they start to dabble in something else. And next thing you know, they can play like 10, five, 10 to 15 instruments. I've always admired people like that. Um, and so what I've been doing more of late is dabbling um, my hands in other areas of a cre creativity because it feeds me in a way that, um, you know, I can't really fully explain, but it just gives me life it, where I am burdened or heavy or struggling to not, you know, listen to the other voice that's saying, you know, that's contradictory to who I am. I tapping into being creative. You may see a keyboard behind me. I'm trying because I want to tap into another space that I haven't even tried yet, but I know is there and it will bring more life and I can have that overflow that you're talking about, Laura, because then I can do what I do from a place of excess and not just the fumes, right? So that's kind of what I've been doing. So I've picked up painting behind, beside me is a, I made it a mouse pad, but it's a painting that I've done. So trying new things so that I can surround myself and feed myself that way. Oh, I love that one. Yes, there's an energy to that. And it moves you into um, a place of not only creativity, but curiosity, um, so much self-discovery in trying new things. I love it. I love it. Um, Esther, talk to me about what you do to fill your picture. <laughs> um, for me, it's using the energy alignment method, which is the tool I talk about in, in the book. Um, so it's a very, very straightforward five-step procedure um, where we tune into the body. So coming back to the body, it gives us, um, it's used as a pendulum. So it's a biofeedback mechanism that determines so we can actually ask ourselves the body's way what's happening in our energy and energy can be both in the mental form emotional form physical form and uh, you know some if it's more on a uh, sometimes on an abstract form we're not always aware of it we're not always thinking if it's on a subconscious level and um, it can be deeply hidden under loads of layers of conditioning. So it's a really good um, system for just asking what's going on. What are the resistance? We call them resistance. We do blocks in our energy and we swiftly in a, the one step, we actually release all of that. And then we align to something really, really empowering and positive. So we work very much on an emotional scale. So we're always seeking to raise our energy, our vibration from a low level to a high level. Uh, and that actually just fills me up every day. If it's done as a regular practice, I feel so much more comfortable, uh, at ease, more in flow, 
and more confident. It builds my confidence, shores that up so that I'm able to go out there and express what I'm here to do, you know, my unique gifts, talents, whatever my serving my purpose um, to help others. Thank you. Um, I love, uh, since you talked about it earlier in the show, I have had a, just a, a vision inside of me of the three places, yeah. right? And so it's like puzzle pieces coming in, <laughs> you know, so I love having a visual when people are talking about something. Um, Kelly, talk to me about what you do to fill your picture. I, I think at the heart of everything is practicing self-compassion. Um, and so many women can resonate with being a caregiver and caring for other people and having high levels of sensitivity and compassion, but it's hard sometimes for us to turn that on ourselves. So for me, it's, um, you know, if I'm sitting and I'm meditating and I'm a little distracted, kind of envisioning myself as a four-year-old next to me and asking, what is it that you really need? in the most tender, kind and loving way towards myself um, as I would my son or another child, and then really listening for what I'm responding with. So sometimes it's, I, I just need to rest and sit for a little while, or I need some time to myself, or like Miss Cayenne said, I need to be doing something creative. I need to take a bath and write a poem, you know? So um, I think it's that practice of ongoing self-love and self-compassion that really fills me up. Yes, love it. Uh, radical self-compassion. We all need to put that in our picture routine, right? For me, you guys, loud music. <laughs> that is an energy shifter. Almost immediately, I clean to music. I make my dinner to music. And I've been really reaching for that a lot this past year, more than I ever have. I, I remember to turn the music on and just relax in it and let that vibration of the music kind of in, infuse into me, right? That's a pretty quick energy shifter for me. And the other, the other um, one for me that I've been doing on a regular basis is just walking in the woods. That nature connection for me is an almost immediate, immediate poem channel. Yeah. And so I have to bring my notebook or my phone with me so that I can do a little, you know, poetry writing when I'm walking. Um, hey, hey, Laura. Yeah. Yep. Walking my dog. Yes. She said that first thing. Yeah. She's walking my dog. <laughs> I get all my best downloads walking in, in the woods. Yes. <laughs> in the lanes. I have uh, learned, to, learned that that's fast and furious. And there's been a couple of times where, you know, you really strangely long poems and things would be starting to come out of me and I would literally look around and just be like, can you just hold on a minute? I need to get back home. <laughs> so yeah, I love that connection. I love it. Um, oh my goodness. Yes. What a great conversation, you guys. Um, okay. So for our listeners, make sure to join us on March 3rd at 10 o'clock Eastern on the Brave Badass Healers Facebook page, you guys, because we're going to have a live stream launch party for the, the book, The Ultimate Guide to Self-Healing, Volume 4, with some pretty awesome giveaways that you're not going to want to miss. And 5% of the proceeds from all paperback sales that day are going to go to help out two of the nonprofits that I love to support, Roots Africa and the Inkwell. And so since we have Miss Cayenne with us, I'm going to give her a minute to talk about the Inkwell, which is her nonprofit. Thank you, Laura. The Inkwell was birthed uh, maybe a year and a half ago um, and kind of feeds right into what I was talking about earlier today. I wanted to be able to provide programming, um, intentional outlets for adults and young people where we would use creative writing. It doesn't have to be a poem, but just creatively writing and reflection, guided reflection, whereby you know, we're guiding that process and, and helping others who may have experienced grief or loss or maybe just, you know, just everyday human beings who are being, as I believe one of our authors said uh, to not today, and, and need some uh, clarity or need to kind of process through some things, why not use a safe and appropriate uh, outlet such as reflective writing or creative reflective writing 
and have the aha moments and begin your own self, your journey to self-healing, self-awareness, and um, self-love. So. Thank you. Um, I can't wait, you guys. Um, I have been working with Miss Cayenne in yeah. terms of the inkwell and all of the things that she's been doing for, I don't know, a couple of years at least, right? I don't know, maybe three. You know how you say two for like, what, five years? And it's been a while. It's it been a while. Um, and it's an amazing organization. And I'm super proud and honored to be supporting it. We'll talk to um, Cedric Noafor in one of our interviews as well. And he's the founder of Roots Africa and an, another amazing organization. So, of course, I'm going to have you hooked up down in the show notes with the information about both of those. Um, and if you happen to be listening after March 3rd, well, that means you can hop over to Amazon right now and grab your copy of the book. So don't delay on that. Um, ladies, thank you so much for what you do in the world and for being here to share it with us. Thank you, Laura. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Laura, for awesome. giving us this privilege to share. Thank you. So I've got one last question for our viewers, and here it is. What if there is something you haven't learned yet about healing that could change everything? Nice. It's time to be brave, you guys. See you next time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Love what you heard today. Don't forget to drop down and hit that subscribe button, you guys, and then join me over at bravehealer.com for just a little bit more healing badassery. Have a great one.